Hello. You are listening to the Grieving Parents Sharing Hope podcast. We are here to walk with parents on their unwanted journey of child loss, guiding them to a place of hope, light, and purpose, not in spite of their child's death, but as a way to honor his or her life. And now, here is your host, author, speaker, and bereaved parent, Laura Deal. Hi. This week's podcast episode is being sponsored by a Pariver couple in the Netherlands, Basha Sukoviego and Sebastian Burkos, in honor of their son, Gabriel, who was born on earth to bloom in heaven. Basha says, we lost Gabriel very early. It was a premature birth at 21 weeks of pregnancy, so he did not get to live on this earth with us. His birth date and departure date are the same, December 9th, 2023, so quite recently he went to live in heaven. This week in March, Basha and Sebastian hit the three-month mark without their little Gabriel Burkos, and I'm sure they have your hearts and your prayers. Thank you, Basha and Sebastian, for sponsoring today's episode in honor and memory of your precious little Gabriel. I have talked about this topic before, but I think it is important to remind some of us of this. And for others, this is probably new information because unfortunately, it is still way too common to hear about what is called the five stages of grief after someone we love dies. And those stages are denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. Now, I am telling you there is no such thing. Does that make you feel relieved? I certainly hope so. Even many counselors do not realize these five stages of grief were introduced in a book called Death and Dying by a psychiatrist named Elizabeth Kubler-Ross back in 1969. Now, this book and what she wrote was inspired by her work with terminally ill patients as her reflection of what they go through in facing their own mortality when they're diagnosed with a disease they cannot recover from. In other words, these five stages of grief was her observation that people go through when they've been told there's nothing else we can do and this person is coming to terms with their own death that is going to happen. Let's think about this. Denial, that makes sense, right? Anger, that makes sense. Bargaining makes a whole lot of sense when you're talking about your own death. God, if you keep me alive, I'll do this. You know, that kind of a bargaining. Now, how in the world, where's the bargaining if this, if these five stages of grief are supposed to be for those of us who have lost someone like our child, what is there to bargain with? Our child's already gone, right? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not even sure where this bargaining stage comes in. You know, God take me instead of my child if our child is sick. But even that bargaining piece doesn't even make sense to me when we're talking about grieving someone's death, but it makes all the sense in the world when you're talking about someone who knows they are dying. And then there's depression and then the acceptance. It was not, like I said, for a pattern for grieving the death of a loved one. These are not stops where we hang out on some kind of a grief timeline. As a matter of fact, it seems that later in her life, Kubler-Ross noted that these five stages are not linear, like people try to make them sound like they are. They're not a linear and predictable progression, even for the terminally ill, and that she regretted writing them in a way that was so misunderstood and how people use it as five stages for those of us who are grieving the death of someone we love. So if you have been concerned that you have not been following these five stages of grief, it's okay. Now, before we moved into the Hope Mobile, whenever I sat at my desk, I was surrounded by memories of my daughter. As a matter of fact, the desk I sat in was my daughter's desk. And some days, those memories would make me smile, and other days, they would once again bring me to tears. Now, holidays and special events definitely have this same issue. Some years are filled with tears. Others are filled with warm memories that bring smiles and even laughter. And I have learned that it's okay because there's no timeline, there's no right or wrong way to grieve 
for not having our child or our children here on earth with us. It's okay to be smiling one minute and crying the next. It's okay to be able to go to one event, but not be able to go to the next event. It's okay to want to talk about my child with someone who misses her or to not want to talk about my child right now to anyone. It's okay to fall apart and be a mess because something triggered a wave of grief and it's okay to have that happen with no explanation. It's okay to finally have a burst of energy one day and then the next day you can't even get out of bed. It's okay not to be okay. Let me say that again. It's okay not to be okay. And I feel like that's encouraging. Well, maybe not to those who've never faced a deep loss like ours, but if you're anything like me, this was such a relief when I found out it's not only okay to be like this all over the place, but it's normal. It gave me so much hope to know that there are other bereaved parents who seem to have figured out how to live without their child who were once in the same not okay place that I still find myself in at times. And I know they find themselves in that place as well, but not nearly as often. And when it happens, it seems to not hit nearly as hard. Now, I'm not sure if you have ever heard of Mitch Carmody or not, but he has become a precious friend to me in the last couple of years. And for many years, he was one of the most known and sought after speakers in the world of bereaved parents, having given his life to those who are grieving after the loss of his nine-year-old son, Kelly, over 30 years ago. Now, he's now retired from traveling and speaking. He doesn't do much of that hardly anymore. But a few years ago, Mitch posted a video. You can still find it on YouTube. I'll put a link to it in the show notes. And the only way I can describe this video is that he allowed us to enter a sacred moment in time for him and his wife. They had just signed the papers to sell their farm that they had lived on for over two decades, and they were moving to another state. They were actually moving here to Wisconsin. And together, they decided it was time. After 30 years of still having many of their son Kelly's possessions in a large trunk, They pulled out just a few items, and then they burned the entire trunk with most of the items still inside, which included the blanket he died in and all of the condolence cards received instead of taking all of these momentums with them when they moved. And like I said, this was 30 years later that they were finally ready to part with this trunk full of Kelly's things. And it just made me so thankful to have people like this ahead of me, people who are willing to let us know things like it's okay if you still have your child's room the same way years later. Even if nobody understands, it's okay. It's normal and it's okay to hang on to as much as we can of our child who's no longer with us on earth for years and years and years. There is no timeline, and there is no right or wrong way to grieve and remember our children. Well, let me add, unless you are harming yourself or somebody around you. But other than that, there is no right or wrong way, and there is no timeline. There is nothing linear about grieving the death of our child. It's like being on a crazy, wild roller coaster that goes up and down and huge hills and small hills and it whips us around corners and it turns us upside down. Sometimes those spiral turns that you just go around and round and round and upside down and then all of a sudden you hit a curve and it jolts you around and sometimes it even feels like all of that is happening in a dark tunnel so we can't see where or how we're going to be thrown around next. Does that kind of sound like how you feel sometimes? There is no such thing as going through five stages of grief, especially when it is your child who has passed. This is a trauma, and you are healing from a trauma, and that takes a long time. And yes, you may experience those what are called stages at some point, You may hit them at different times, at different intensities, but you are the only one who can determine what grieving your child 
needs to be for you. And those first two or three years or so can feel like nothing but a tangled mess, not a bunch of grief stages we are supposed to be working our way through. Is the Grieving Parents Sharing Hope podcast been a blessing to you? Is what I share here each week helping you with the loss of your child and giving you some hope? If so, would you consider giving it a rating, hopefully five stars, and a review on whatever platform you use to listen to me and share hope with you each week? Just click on the show itself, scroll and find where you find the stars to give a review, and tap on how many stars you think I deserve with this podcast. Like I said, hopefully five. And then select Write a Review and tell those who might be considering listening why you like this podcast and how it has helped you. You don't have to write anything really long, just takes a few seconds. And this is one way you can be a grieving parent sharing hope because you're giving hope to someone else that, yes, listen to this podcast. It's going to help you, and this is how it's helped me. Also remember to share this podcast, Grieving Parents Sharing Hope, with other bereavers who need the hope that you have been receiving. And I just want to say thank you for that. Let's go ahead with today's birthday segment. Patrick Palazzo was born on March 2nd and is forever 24. Aaron Wright was born on March 3rd and is forever 32. Jonathan Van Vertigem was born on March 6th and is forever 19. We celebrate the day these children came into the world and into the lives of these families. We know it will always be an important and a special day worth celebrating. If you would like to have your child's birthday announce the week of his or her birthday, I would love to be able to do that for you. Just go to gpshope.org slash birthdays. Fill out that form, submit the information, and I will share your child's birthday with the listeners the week of his or her birthday. Dave will also send you an email to remind you to listen that week. I want to say thank you again to Basha and Sebastian for sponsoring today's episode in memory of your precious little Gabriel. If you would like to sponsor an episode in honor and memory of your child, it's just a $50 tax-free donation to GPS Hope to help us keep going. And you can pick the week that you would like to sponsor and write up what you want shared, what you want the listeners to know about your child that I will read to everyone. Just go to gpshope.org, go to the donation tab, and find where it says sponsor a podcast episode. Click on that, and you'll see the rest of it there. It'll show you what to do, and I would love to be able to share your child with the other listeners. A few minutes ago, I said our grief was like a tangled mess. Now, I've been a knitter since my school years. So for me, I can see our grief like a tangled mess of yarn. Sometimes it feels impossible to untangle. It's just full of knots and we just can't get it undone. And a lot of times we just feel like giving up. Our emotions are all over the place, and we don't know what we're going to find as we continue to try and untangle the painful mess. It's okay to feel like you aren't doing it right because you're not going through the stages of grief like some people say we should. In fact, really, honestly, I would be concerned for you if you are working your way nice and neatly through these five stages. There is no rhyme or reason to everything we feel and the grief and the triggers. So please let yourself be okay with not being okay. And especially don't think something is wrong because you are not going through those five stages of grief that do not even exist. So as you work through your tangled mess of grief, Remember that we are doing this together, so hold on. Pain eases. There is hope.